Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please let us be seated and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for this chance to be gathered in your house, to sing your praises, to lift up our prayers. Father, focus us. Uh, we have short attention spans, and our minds wander easily. Focus us. Focus us on your word. Plant your word deep in our hearts, deep in our minds. Let us not be distracting to others or be distracted ourselves. And help us just to hear from your word, Father. And uh, that, that the faith that you gave to us, that it would grow, that it would blossom, that it would bud and flourish and bear the fruit that you desire for it to bear. Father, that, that frankly others would be blessed and that, of course, ultimately that you would be glorified. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. 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 So, my wife, uh, Kathy, and I, we've been married a little bit over 30 years. Uh, I, I'm in the picture on the left. <laughs> and uh, last night, uh, somebody <laughs> said to me, how did somebody that looks like you get a wife that looks like yours. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, it must have been my, my, my charm or my great singing ability. I don't know what it was. You know, Kathy kind of rolled her eyes. And, uh, and you know, but it is, you know, it's a, it was a great day. Uh, in the picture uh, on the right side of the screen is a picture of my great, great grandfather, uh, John Buckman. He and Christine came from Germany at the turn of the century. They lived in Chicago, actually, for 10 years. And um, their oldest daughter would be married at Saint, what is now called St. James. Back in the day, it was called St. Jacoby. Uh, St. James Lutheran in Lincoln Park, uh, which is where I did the Marweedy wedding this past year uh, in front of that exact same altar. So I just thought I want to share a little picture of my family story with you. You know, um, if, I, if I was to say to somebody, I was married. You know, that would create in their mind a certain impression, right? Obviously, that, that I was married, implying that I'm, what? Not now married. Uh, if my wife was to hear that, you know, it might, might cause her eyebrows to arch. Or, who knows, but hopefully it wouldn't be a pleasant response. <laughs> if, I, if I was to say, I will be married, right? Same thing, except they can reverse, right? That, that, that would cause a certain idea in people's minds, right? That, that I, I, I'm not now married, but I, but I will be married, right? Jesus, in the reading for today, he uses the present tense. He says, I am the true vine. Not, not I was the true vine. Certainly true, but that's not what he says. Not I will be the true vine, also certainly true, but not what he says. What he says is, I am the true vine. And this is hugely important to, to understand that Jesus desires in the present tense, right now, to be in a relationship with you. And we're going to, we're going to unpack that a little bit. And, and, and what does this phrase, I am, mean? You know, there are, there are people who, uh, especially liberal theologians, uh, who, will, who will look at the, this passage this where Jesus says, I am the true vine, and they'll say, well, that's just, that's just good grammar. He's just using a form of the verb to be. No, it's not. It's much more than that. And please don't let liberal theologians rob you of the confidence and the power that is yours in the word of God. When Jesus says, I am, and we're going to unpack that, trust me, we're going to unpack that this morning. When he says that, he's saying it intentionally, and it was hugely significant in the context of his audience. 2,000 years ago, an Orthodox Jewish person Hearing Rabbi Jesus say, I am, they, I mean, they would have woken up. Whatever it was that they were thinking about, that was done with. When they hear the rabbi say, I am, that means something. Why? Because about 1,500 years before that, when Moses was wandering around the backside of the desert, God comes to Moses 
and speaks to Moses through the burning bush, and he recruits Moses then to lead the Israelites out of captivity into the promised land. If you remember the story, Moses doesn't really respond real great. You know, he throws a lot of obstacles up in front of God. And then finally, God is able to kind of talk Moses into it. You know, really, it's only because, largely because Aaron is going to get saddled with the speaking responsibilities until Moses grows into the job, if you will. And at some point in that conversation, then Moses will ask God, well, when I'm talking to the Israelites, who should I say sent me? And what is God's response? God's response in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, is simply this. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That's my name. That's what you're to call me. I am. And so when Jesus says, I am, about himself, he is declaring something hugely important. He's declaring that he is God in human form. And, you know, liberal theologians today, they, they may deny that. They may try to obfuscate that. They may try to distract you from that. They may come up with all sorts of clever-sounding and dumb arguments. But make no mistake... To the informed and intelligent Jew in Jesus' day, they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And that's why we see over and over and over again that when Jesus would make these sort of statements, that their response on the, behalf of, on the part of some of them would be to try to kill Jesus. In John chapter 8, we see this. And why are they wanting to kill Jesus? Because to their way of thinking, Jesus is blaspheming. He's just, but to their way of thinking, he's but a, a mere man claiming to be God. And so Jesus, we read in John chapter 8, it says that Jesus says to the folks who are gathered there, Amen, Amen, Lego, Umen, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, <laughs> I am. <laughs> At that point, that they stopped, they stopped being, you know, distracted by whatever they were thinking about, and they tried to kill Jesus. But it was not his appointed time yet. And so it says they, they picked up stones to throw at him. And one of the things that you, you need to understand is that Jesus doesn't just do this once or twice. My gosh, in the Gospel of John, there are seven times that is recorded. So who knows how many more times Jesus actually may have said this. But there are seven times that are recorded, and I've got them up here for you, where Jesus will use this phrase, this description of God, I am, the tetragrammaton, that I am. He will use this to describe himself, and he will use this in the context of a metaphor. And if you look at this, you'll see uh, great insight into God's uh, desire to have a relationship with you through his Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what does Jesus bring to the table, if you will? Jesus says in John chapter 6, this is after he's just, and I'm going I'm to go through these, have to go through these kind of quickly. But in John chapter 6, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, right? And, and then Jesus will say to them, unless you eat my flesh, you have no part in me. He says, I am the bread of life. If you want to have eternal life, you have to eat what I provide. And so we remember those words and we hear those words again when we come to the Lord's table, when we come to the Lord's table, it's not like this is the only time where Jesus talks about eating his flesh. We read about this in John chapter 6. And then in John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And that should speak to us that you and I live in a darkened world, that we live in a world that is absent the wisdom and the will of God, and that therefore in the minds and in the hearts of people around us and how we come into the world is that same way. But God loves us so much that he brought his light to shine in this world. And that light is found in the person of Jesus. Jesus says in John chapter 10, I am the door of the sheep. If you consider yourself to be a sheep, uh, one who follows in the flock of Jesus, then know this and make it known that it's only through the doorway of Jesus that you will enter in to the sheepfold. And then Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And that's what we talked about last Sunday. 
Remember we talked about how in the Old Testament God describes how he is a shepherd of his flock and all the things, we went through those verses, all those things that God says about himself. And then Jesus says this about himself. And so what is Jesus saying? He's saying that he is God and he makes it so clear. He says, I am the good shepherd. And then what happens when you die? Well, if you believe upon Jesus, it's not the end and it's certainly not an end separated from the Father in heaven. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then in John 14, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one will come to the Father except that they come through me. Jesus is crystal clear. He is God come in human form. And this is what being in a relationship with him is all about. And so then this is the final of the seven I am statements that are recorded in the Gospel of John. And it's hugely important. I am the, not a, I am the true vine. And in the, in the, the thing I, I want us to draw attention to also today is the present tense nature, again, the present tense nature of this relationship that Jesus wants with you. You know, the reality is that even as Christians, even as born-again, baptized, believing Christians who, who confess Christ as Lord and Savior, believe in our hearts that he was raised from the dead, all of us, all of us, at times, doubt our walk with God. At times, we, we focus on our, on our past failures, our faults, our sins, our shortcomings. And, and, and if we're not careful, we can become despondent. We can, be, we can begin to doubt our relationship with God. We can even begin to doubt God's care for us. And, and if we're not in that ditch on that side of the road, then we're in the other ditch on the opposite side of the road, which is all we're worried about is all the future boogeymen that are out there, all these possible problems you know, that we see in the news or that we hear at the water cooler. And, and then we begin to think, oh my gosh, to make it through all these challenges that are coming up in my life, well, I'm going to have to sell my soul. I'm going to have to shortchange my relationship with Jesus. I'm going to have to hide my walk with the Lord. I'm just going to have to try and blend in and fly under the radar and not be true to what God has called me to be. And, and so Jesus says to you and to me today, Know that I am the true vine. I am in a relationship with you. I, yes, and I know you. I know your shortcomings. I know your faults. I know the ones that you don't think I know or that I forgot about. I know them. And yet, in spite of all that, I desire to be in a relationship with you. Jesus says, I am. When we want to think about the past and worry about the future, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Enough of the difficulties, enough is the evil of this day. When we are weary and heavy burdens, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy and my load is light. Jesus says in verse 1, I am the true vine. There's, there's so much in these five words. You know, for the Israelites going into the promised land, the promised land represented God's provision for them. And what Jesus has come in part to say is this, that all of God's best for you is found in and through a relationship with me. And then, you know, we would say, well, what, what, how would I know that? And Jesus would say, I am. <laughs> Look and see, touch me, talk to me. Know that I am the one who will make this possible for you. In Christ alone, brothers and sisters, in Christ alone is our blessing. He is, he is the true vine. And we need to, to be careful that we don't get grafted into a false vine. Or that we don't think we, in our pridefulness, that we can do this without Jesus. My wife and I got to go to a Casting Crowns concert. Uh, it was Friday night, and it was a great concert. And at some point there in the concert, Mark, the lead singer, and this is their 20th year of, of public ministry, Mark, the lead singer, brought up this very verse. And he said, you know, we're, we're told that Jesus is the true vine and that we're grafted into the true vine. And Mark said this, he said, he said do you know what a, a branch from the vine is called when it's separate from the vine? A stick. 
Don't be a stick. Be connected to the vine. You know, in Revelation chapter 21, it says this amazing thing. It says that in heaven there will be no temple because Jesus himself is our temple. Jesus is the place where we connect with and are connected to our loving Father in heaven. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Now watch this. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he says, that's okay. No, he doesn't. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And so you and I, we've got to be honest about this. There are parts of our lives that are not bearing fruit that is pleasing to God. We're going to say, oh, we're bearing fruit. Yeah, but it's not the kind of fruit that God wants, right? Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, fruit that is desired by God, right, he prunes. So even when you look at your life, you say, well, I see God at work in my life in this way, and I see God at work in my life in that way. Praise God. Give God the glory. Give God the praise clap. But know this also. You're going to hear a shoo, shoo, shoo. That's the sign of the prune, pruning that's going to happen in your life. Because God is going to want you to be even more fruitful. God is a jealous God. He desires for us, it says in 2 Corinthians, that we would be transformed into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And then listen to this. And these are such great words of grace as we begin to wrap up. Jesus says this to you today. Already, already you are clean. Right now as you sit here, you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You are spotless before your Father in heaven. Already you are clean. Why? Because you did such a super job this past week. Because you improved 10% in your Christian life. No, not exactly. Why? Because of the word that I have spoken to you. It's the word that creates. It's the word that makes the new creation possible. And so Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. God's word does it all. Luther would say this regarding the Reformation. He would say that that all that he did was proclaim the word of God. And the word did it all. And that's what we find in our walk with God today. That when we begin worship, we confess our sins, and the Word of God brings to us His forgiveness. In in the sacrament of communion, we're going to hear the Word attached to the means, the bread and the wine, and God's power of forgiveness is going to come to you and I. Why? Because this is the means that Jesus established for God's work to be done. Salvation comes through hearing the word, Scripture says. And in prayer, we lift up the word that God has given to us. We pray his words back to him. Jesus says, I am the true vine. And this is so important for us to remember, because our mission statement is about living this Christian life in large part, right? It says we're going to glorify God by spreading the gospel, and we're going to focus on our preaching and our teaching. And then it says we're also going to focus on... Living our daily lives. And how would we live our daily life as a Christian? By being connected in the present tense to the vine. You know, in the first century, there was a Jewish priest by the name of Josephus. And he was, uh, he was an Orthodox priest. And uh, the Jewish people were, as they often were at that time, in rebellion against Rome. And, um, and, so, and so Josephus, being a priest, and in that culture, priests are oftentimes called in to then be also civil leaders. And so Josephus was then called in by the people, not only to serve as priest, but then to serve as a leader in this rebellion against Rome. And Josephus would ultimately would, would lose in the battle that he fought against the Roman legion there. And not only would he lose, but he would be taken prisoner. And he would be hauled off uh, by the Romans. But then Josephus, of his own free will, would become a Roman citizen and would go to work for the Roman army and become a Roman officer. And in fact, he would become a historian of, of much of the Jewish history. And Josephus, he would take the Roman name Flavius as his first name, as his surname. Flavius Josephus is how we remember him today. 
he uh, said this uh, regarding the temple. He described the temple of Herod's time. And, and he described it in this way, and you can read this. This is the book, one of the books that he wrote, The War of the Jews. And in this chapter 4, he says this. He says, but that gate, which was at the end of the first part of the temple, was as, as have already been observed, covered over with gold, right? So there's this archway into the temple covered with gold. Now listen to this. It also had golden vines in the gold on the archway there. It had golden vines uh, up above, right? From which, uh, in, in the gold, in the archway, hung grapes. Now, now look at this description. As tall as a man's height. So when you went into the house of God, the house of prayer for all the nations, you, one of the things that you would see if you were paying attention as you walked into God's house is you would see this golden archway and you would see, as Flavius Josephus describes it, the, this uh, vine and these grapes that were monstrous in size. And so what, what is that picture about? What's the scriptural basis for it? Well, if you go back in the Old Testament, you will read in Numbers chapter 13 that when Moses sends the Israelite spies into the promised land, that as they were going along, it says in Numbers chapter 13, it says that the Israelite spies came to the valley of Eshcol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes. So it's just one cluster of grapes. Now look at how this is described. It was so big that it took two grown men to carry it between them on a pole. That is a massive cluster of grapes. It, 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 was, it was just one of the things that when the Israelites saw this, they said, oh my gosh, this is just beyond our comprehension. And so brothers and sisters in Christ, what I want to encourage you today is to have that picture in your mind of the temple of the Lord, of going into the house of prayer, of seeing this cluster of grapes as big as a man, of reading in Numbers chapter 13 of what this cluster of grapes look like. And then to remember this, that Jesus says, I am the true vine. And if that can happen in his creation, my goodness, what can happen in a relationship with him? He calls you to abide with him. And then he makes this promise. I'm going to close with this. Now listen to these words and think about that picture in your mind. Jesus says this. Don't call him a liar. Jesus says this. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, yeah, you thought I wasn't getting to this. I am. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Oh, so Jim, you mean that if I just sit there and pray, oh, give me the winning lottery ticket number, then I'm going to get the win? No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you abide in me, that means if you rest, if you remain, if your heart and your head are focused on me, and my words abide in you. So before you come in with this little silly thing about winning the lottery, just find me a scripture passage where Jesus said that, right? Oh, he did, right? So then his words are not abiding in you when you're thinking that way, right? So what does Jesus say? If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. In other words, then when you are praying, you're not praying to God according to your evil intents and selfish-centered desires, but you are praying according to the will and the word and the work of God. Well, guess what your Father in Heaven is going to do? Guess what? He's going to make that come to pass. And I want to encourage you today to start taking Jesus at his word in your life. And let his word be your light and your lamp. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus alone. Amen.